Hello and welcome. I'm Andy Goldstein. I'm Steve Chris. And we are here to talk to you about disaster recovery for your Kubernetes clusters. A little bit about ourselves. I'm a staff systems engineer at Heptio. I have been programming for a long time. I started with Commodore 64 Basic, and I'm now up using Go. And I've been a Kubernetes contributor since 2014. And I am the Heptio Arc team lead. And I'm Steve Chris. I'm a senior systems engineer at Heptio. Uh, I work on Heptio Arc with Andy. And uh, I've been, in the past, a contributor to upstream Kubernetes and also a member of the release team. And in a past life, I was uh, an enterprise IT engineer, so I certainly have some experience with uh, the challenges of designing, implementing, and testing DR strategies. All right, can I get a show of hands? How many of you manage uh, clusters in production? All right, and how many of you have a disaster recovery strategy? Excellent. And how many of you have actually used it to recover from something? OK, a few of you. So let's talk about what is it that you want in your IT infrastructure. What you want is a collection of servers and services and applications that are all running perfectly well. You've got your monitoring in place, and all of your check marks are green because everything is running great. But before we get to that, <laughs> so you want to sleep uh, soundly at night uh, because everything is running correctly. But what actually happens? Well, at some point, no matter how good your infrastructure is, no matter how excellent your network is, something is going to go wrong. You'll probably get a page or a phone call or a Slack notification, and you're going to have to deal with it. And in the short term, you're probably not going to be very happy. But that's OK, because we're going to give you some ideas around how you can do disaster recovery for your Kubernetes clusters. So the first thing you need to do is probably do some rebuilding. And some of the tools that we're going to present today hopefully will help you with that. So before we get into talking about uh, DR for Kubernetes, I want to do a quick review of uh, what DR might look like in a more traditional IT setting. So in the old world, we had a pretty strong correspondence between an app and a server. And so typically, we would deploy a single app onto a single server. Now, that application might be made up of multiple components. And the server might be virtual. It might be physical. Uh, but regardless, there is a, a very strong correspondence between the application and the server. And so if we ever had a disaster and we needed to recover the service for the application, uh, we need to be able to bring back the server with all of the same software uh, configuration and data as it had before. And so typically, the way that we would do this is we would take full backups of our server uh, on a regular basis, a nightly basis, typically. And if we ever had a disaster and the server went down, uh, we do a full restore from our backup, bring up a new server that was essentially identical to the old one. And this would enable us to restore the service for our application. In the new world, with Kubernetes, uh, things look a little bit different than that. And so now, when you're running a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you don't just have one server. You have uh, one or more masters, which are running the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, you have many nodes, which are running, again, some Kubernetes components, uh, as well as all of your containerized workloads. Uh, and then you also have an etcd cluster, uh, which may be running in or outside of your Kubernetes cluster, but this is actually storing all of your, your Kubernetes state information. And so let's take a look at what's inside each of those a little bit more. So within the master, uh, we have, first of all, the Kubernetes API server. And this is the entry point for creating or fetching information about Kubernetes state. Uh, we have a scheduler, which is responsible for uh, deciding which nodes pods should run on. We have a controller manager, which is going to be running the core control loops uh, to constantly push the state of the Kubernetes cluster towards the desired state. And then we have etcd, which is our uh, persistent store of state information for Kubernetes. And then we also potentially have uh, some CNI pods and a kube proxy, which are going to help with all the, the networking and communication concerns. And then on the nodes, we also have uh, kube proxy and the CNI pods for networking. Um, beyond that, we have uh, all of your containerized workloads in the form of pods. And so as we start to think about how to design a DR strategy for, uh, for this new Kubernetes environment, we really need to think about uh, where is the state within this environment, which components are stateful, and which are stateless. 
And so if we think about where state is, it's really in two places within this system. And the first is obviously etcd. etcd is the persistent store of all of the Kubernetes state information. Uh, contains all the specs for your deployments, your services, your config maps, and your secrets, et cetera. And the second is in your persistent volumes for your applications. So if you have workloads that are uh, using volumes to store persistent data, we obviously have a lot of state here. And so these are really the key components that we need to focus on and make sure that we have robust backup strategies so that we can restore this data in the case of a failure. But if we think about the masters and the nodes themselves that are running the core Kubernetes components, they're really basically stateless. And so this means that if we, as long as we can quickly bring up new versions of those in the case of a failure, we don't really need to restore from an exact copy of the previous version of them. We can spin up a new cluster, and as long as we can restore our etcd data and our persistent volume data, we'll be able to restore service to our applications. So let's talk about master and no disaster recovery. Like Steve said, they're basically stateless. Um, you may have some of these that are unhealthy. Maybe they're running okay for the most part, but you're getting some alerts. You've got a disk that is flaky, a network card that's not performing correctly. So there's some tools you can use to take these out of service. Cube Control has a couple of features, Cordon and Drain, that you'll probably want to add to your toolbox. Cordon allows you to mark a node as unschedulable, so any new pods that are created will not be assigned to whatever node you've cordoned. And drain goes one step further and will actually evict any pods that are running on a node that you're trying to take out of service. And once you've done that, as Steve said, you want to very quickly be able to provision a replacement master or node. So how do you do that? Automate it. Now unfortunately, we are not going to be able to tell you the one and only one way to automate recovering and reprovisioning a master or a node or a cluster because you all have opinions. You have IT departments who say, we're using Ansible or we're using Chef or we're using Puppet. So we can't tell you what to use, but we are strongly encouraging you to automate the creation of masters, nodes, and clusters. One thing to keep in mind is that there is a teeny tiny amount of state that is necessary to preserve, and those are the certificates that are used for the components in the cluster to talk to each other. So when your kubelets talk to the master or to the API servers, and when the controller manager talks to the API servers, there typically are SSL certificates that are used, and these things you want to maintain and retain and incorporate into your automation so that when you have your Ansible or your Chef or your Puppet and you're using that to automate provisioning all of these instances, you wanna bring your certificates with you so that you don't lose them. If you do lose them, you have to regenerate them or re get new ones and you potentially uh, could have an outage in that situation. And I do wanna highlight that recovering the masters and the nodes is not really the crux of the disaster recovery problem. Stateful data is what we're really here about. So let's talk about etcd first. There's a few different ways that you can approach disaster recovery for etcd. The first two are similar. At the block level, you could take a backup of the partition or the disk where the etcd data directory resides. This is where all of your etcd state is. And with something like this, if you lose one of your members, if you have a highly available etcd cluster, and you definitely should, uh, if you restore from either the block device or at the file system level, you just take a, a backup of the directory and restore it. Uh, when your member comes back online, it will get a, a delta of the data that happened in the cluster since it was offline. So the, the surviving members will send a snapshot of what it needs to catch up, and so your cluster can become whole again. Another option is to use etcd control. They have a great feature uh, as part of the etcd3 API to be able to take a snapshot of your etcd database and at some point in the future, restore it. This one you've gotta be a little bit careful with though because if you do a snapshot and restore, when you restore it ends up creating a brand new etcd cluster. So this effectively means you will have an outage if you go this route, but it's a good tool to have 
Uh, in the event that you have a total, total outage, you can certainly recover some of your etcd state this way, assuming you have backups. And then the fourth option here, which is our favorite, is using Kubernetes itself to get the information out of the API server about what's running in the cluster. So the API machinery special interest group spent a lot of time building a discovery mechanism so you can go to your Kubernetes API server as a client and you can say, what are all of the API groups that exist? And within each API group, what are all other resources that exist? So you can look at the core API and you can see that there are pods and deployments and or pods and secrets, et cetera. You can go to the apps API and see all the deployments. And this is something, it's very easy to write, just a, a loop, you can iterate through everything and say, tell me all the data that you have. So what about persistent volumes? Because presumably, if you've got stateful workloads in a Kubernetes cluster, you probably are using persistent volumes for that. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer here, at least for a generic one because some of your data might be in cloud provider-specific persistent volumes, EBS volumes, Azure managed disks, GCE persistent disks, et cetera. So there's nothing in Kubernetes that right now allows you to say, take a snapshot of my PV. There's a proposed uh, set of APIs to do that, but they're not available yet. So if you've got Kubernetes in production and you've got persistent volumes, Maybe you've got some tooling that you've written to do it, but unfortunately you can't rely on Kubernetes for that. And there's other volume types as well beyond just the cloud provider ones. NFS volumes, anything that can come in from a flex volume. So how do you back those up? Again, it tends to be roll your own, but we have a better solution. We'll get to that in a minute here with Steve. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to talk to you now about an open source tool we built uh, called Heptio Arc. Um, and its purpose is to help with uh, backing up some of that stateful data that we've talked about within your Kubernetes cluster. So what exactly does Heptio Arc do? So it has two core features. And the first one is that it enables you to back up and restore your Kubernetes API objects. Now, Andy just talked to us about some of the different options for backing those up uh, in terms of what's in etcd. And we use, in Arc, the Kubernetes Discovery API for accessing all of that information and creating backups of it, as well as restoring it in the case of a disaster. And we do this for a few reasons. Um, and Andy started to talk about some of the pros and cons there. But um, you know, one of the reasons we think the Discovery API makes a lot of sense is that um, if you're running in a managed Kubernetes uh, provider, you may not have access to the underlying etcd cluster. And so using etcd CTL to take snapshots may not even be a feasible option for you. Um, additionally, uh, Arc and using the Discovery API gives you a lot of fine-grained control over uh, what types of resources you back up. So with etcd backups, it's really kind of all or nothing. And if you want to restore your cluster, you basically have to restore the state of the entire cluster. If you're using the API, though, you have all of the controls that it provides you in terms of filtering by namespace, filtering by resource types, filtering by label selectors. And so we enable this all through Arc. And additionally, um, if you are backing up etcd directly, uh, you, you don't get the benefit of being able to capture all of the information that is stored for extension API mechanisms. So if you have an extension API server as part of your cluster, odds are that the data to support that is actually stored in a separate etcd cluster. This is the recommendation for, for how to design these extension mechanisms. And so if you're backing up etcd, you're not gonna capture that information. But if you use the discovery API, this will actually aggregate all of that information about extension API servers. And so you can just back that information up directly into your, your Arc backup or whatever other backup mechanism you have. And so we believe that the, the discovery API makes a lot of sense here for accessing that information. So Arc uses the Discovery API to, to pull that all out of your cluster, and it uh, creates a tarball uh, that stores all this information and places the backup in the object storage system of your choice. Now, the second big feature that Arc has is that it will actually back up and restore your persistent volumes for you, assuming you're on one of the supported cloud provider platforms. And as Andy mentioned a minute ago, uh, we, we use the snapshot APIs that the cloud providers offer. Uh, for taking backups of volumes. Um, Arc out of the box supports the three major public clouds, 
Uh, but as we'll see in a minute, we also have an easy way to extend the, the functionality of Arc to support the platform of your choice. So as long as there's an API for you to take backups, Arc can easily integrate with that. Now beyond those two big features, uh, we have another of a uh, number of other features that make it uh, really easy for you to use. So we support scheduled backups. So rather than having to go manually create a backup, uh, you can simply configure the information you'd like to back up through Arc, set a schedule, and have those run on an automated basis uh, over time. Additionally, as I mentioned a minute ago, we support um, complex filtering, uh, both when you take a backup of information, as well as when you do a restore of that information back into a cluster. So you can filter based on the namespaces you want to back up, based on the resource types, and based on label selectors. And so often we see that users will take a backup of their entire cluster so that they have all of the information. And when they go to do a restore, they may do it on a namespace by namespace basis, or they may only restore uh, components that match a certain label selector. And so this gives you a lot of control over how you recover the information into your target cluster. <laughs> Additionally, we, we give you the ability to restore into different namespaces than you backed up from. And so this is really useful for use cases where maybe you have an existing namespace and you want to create a clone of it, uh, maybe for testing purposes so that you can fiddle with some configuration, um, or maybe you have other use cases that uh, require you to change the namespace. Arc makes that really easy to do. Now, we also designed Arc to be very extensible. Um, we recognize that we can't meet everyone's needs out of the box, and so we want to give users the ability to extend Arc to meet their needs. And so the first of these mechanisms is what's called hooks. And hooks are basically a way for you as the, the user of Arc to define scripts that need to be run within your pods immediately before or immediately after backing up those pods. And so a great example of this is if, you're, uh, if you have a pod that's running that's using a persistent volume, and prior to executing a backup of that volume, you actually need to freeze the file system to ensure you get a consistent backup. Arc makes it really easy to plug in an FS freeze command before the backup, and similarly an unfreeze command right after the backup. The second major way that we allow you to extend Arc is through what's called plugins. And so there are uh, sort of two major categories of plugins that we support currently. The first one has to do with, uh, with cloud providers. And so there are, there are kind of two core cloud provider APIs that Arc relies on. Uh, the first one is object storage, which is where we actually store the tarball uh, that contains all of your, your etcd data. And the second one is block storage, and this is uh, what allows you to take snapshots of your volumes and restore them later on. And so we have a plugin model which allows you to define your own implementations for both of these and to very easily plug it into the Arc server at runtime so that you can extend Arc to run on your platform of choice. And this doesn't require you to submit PRs to the Arc the core Arc code base doesn't require you to recompile or maintain your own component uh, container images. The second major category of plugins is what are called uh, item actions, and we support these on both backup and restore. And so these are little bits of functionality that run as each item is being backed up or restored. And they're different from hooks in that uh, they're not actually scripts that are being executed within your pods. They're being run by the Arc server, and they allow you to potentially call out to external systems to take certain actions, or they allow you to actually mutate the item that you're backing up or restoring. So if you need to add it, some annotations to items as you're backing them up, add labels, or maybe you want to actually modify the spec as you're restoring your backup into a new cluster, we make it really easy for you to plug in your own logic to do this. All right, so we have a demo. Hopefully the demo gods are with us today. <laughs> Okay, so let me run our script here. So this is all live. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is show you what namespaces we have. And we have the typical ones you'd see, default, cube public, cube system. We also have Heptio Arc, which is where Arc is running. And we are using Rook for dynamic provisioning uh, for persistent volumes today. So we're gonna start by deploying a simple Nginx application, and you'll see that this creates a namespace, a PVC, a deployment, and a service. So if we take a look at what the PVC looks like, 
This is a rook block storage class and it is bound and we are going to be storing the logs for Nginx in this persistent volume. So here is the PV. Similarly, you'll see that it's bound to Nginx logs. And if we take a look at the deployment, we want one replica and we have one running. And here is the pod. So everything deployed great for us here. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this service. So we see it's got a cluster IP. So let's go ahead and talk to Nginx. Looks pretty straightforward. So the next thing we're gonna do here is hit it 10 more times just to get some extra traffic in the logs. And we'll go ahead and exec into the Nginx container so that we can see We've got a couple files in here, access log, about a kilobyte, nothing in the error log yet. And now let's actually look at this access log. So we're gonna exec into the container and take a look at that file. And pretty vanilla access log, we've got uh, the initial request that we made and then the 10 after. So let's create a backup. It's this simple. You just say arc backup create, give it a name, and then whatever filters you want. In this case, we're only going to select the Nginx namespace, and it's done. So we have an ARC backup. The data is available in object storage. For this demo, we're using Minio deployed into the cluster, but in a real world scenario, you probably would want to have your data backed up outside of your cluster. So it's time for a disaster. We're going to go ahead and delete the Nginx namespace. This will delete all of the components that we just deployed, including the persistent volume that was dynamically provisioned. Uh, one of the great things about ARC is that it can walk from the pod to the persistent volume claim to the persistent volume to figure out that there is a relationship between the three and make sure that we back up everything that we need to be backing up. Alrighty, so our namespace has been deleted here. I will prove that to you. So you can see we do not have an Nginx namespace anymore. And just to show you that there's no longer a PV anymore, that is gone, we can't find it. So let's go ahead and use ARC to restore the backup that we just took. And while this is happening, um, I will say that when the backup was going, uh, what Steve described about doing an FS freeze before and after the snapshot was taken was exactly what we had ARC do today. So our restore is done. Let's go ahead and take a look. We have a PVC, it's bound using the rook block storage class again. And we have PV similarly. So this is just gonna show everything that we had before, but the, um, the individual names for anything that has a generated name like the uh, pods, for example, this has a different name than it did before. And everything is running, fantastic. Let's go to the service. This is a different IP than we had before. And we'll go ahead and Take a look at that file system. And again, this is the log file system from the persistent volume that ARC restored. Still has about a kilobyte. That is wonderful. Let's go ahead and take a look at that file. It's all of our data, so we have not lost anything. And just to show that we can augment it, we'll go ahead and curl it another time and take a look at the file size and the file one more time. So you'll see that 1045 has gone up to 1140. And if we take a look at the file one last time, you'll see that we had a series of um, requests from 20 past the hour and then the last one from 23 minutes. So uh, our backup was successful, our restore was successful, and we were able to continue using the data that was in the volume that we recovered. And that's the end of the demo. Let me get this back. There we go. Great. Thanks, Andy, for the demo. So uh, I'd like to say please come join us in the ARC community. Uh, so Andy and I obviously both work at Heptio, but ARC is completely open source. Uh, we have a number of external contributors who have been working on ARC since the initial release. And so we'd love to have you come join us, uh, whether it's to provide feedback on ARC, uh, whether it's to provide real-world use cases that you're using it for, uh, or whether you'd like to add features yourself, uh, please come talk to us. So we're easily accessible uh, through GitHub or through Slack. We have a Slack channel in the Kubernetes org. Uh, we have a Google group if you'd like to subscribe for release notifications, uh, and we're on Twitter as well. So please come join us. And we, we really are looking for your input. Um, we have 
so many ideas about backup and recovery, but I'm sure you have more and specific needs. So please do come and find us, whether it's today or next week, or next month, uh, we would appreciate the input. And at this point, if anyone has any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Uh, why don't you come up to the mics? I think uh, everyone will be able to hear. That'd be great. Take one over here. Oh, sure. Go ahead. So in this case, if you restore back a copy that doesn't include data about a pod that like happened to survive whatever outage you had, what happens to that pod? So is the question if the, the backup didn't include the pod and then there was a restore? Yeah, exactly. Um, best effort for what happens. I mean, if you are expecting that pod to be running and it's, it's not in your backup, then it certainly won't be in, in your recovery. So um, you just need to be careful with what, how you spec out your backups and make sure that um, you know, your label selector is appropriate to match your pods and whatever else you need, or you don't use label selectors and you just say, I want to back up everything. OK, cool, thanks. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> it's sort of a Kubernetes very specific question, like if there are pods running on your machines that are Kubernetes manages, duh, or rather just containers that aren't part of pods that Kubernetes knows about, will Kubernetes kill those or let them continue or like? So Kubernetes will not touch any containers that it's not responsible for. Okay. Uh, and so similarly, if you have containers that you are running manually and then you do an arc backup and an arc restore, we don't know anything about those containers because Kubernetes doesn't. Okay, it doesn't like wipe and recreate. Okay. No, cool. um, the kubelet will leave them untouched. Cool, thanks. Sure. Take one over here. Hi. What's the uh, appropriate way to monitor whether a backup was successful or failed, really, if it failed? Good question. Uh, so we have logs that are stored per backup. So uh, when we start doing a backup, you'll see that it's in progress. And when the backup has completed or failed, you'll be able to retrieve those logs and see what the problems were. If Is there, there any were. way you can add like a status hook um, or something to just say, you know, just call this service webhook script, whatever, to be like, this didn't work, and I just want you to know. That's a really good idea, and it's actually in line with something we are planning on doing, which is um, in addition to the pod hooks that Steve mentioned, we do want to have just overall backup level hooks. So when it starts, send out a webhook. When it finishes, whether it was um, successful or a failure, send out a notification as well. Yeah, I don't care if it's successful. Just, <laughs> just, it failed. just that it's the, done. Yeah. The other thing to note is that um, backups, restores, and, and many of the other uh, ARC concepts are CRDs within yep. Kubernetes. And so you always have the option to uh, write a watch on the CRDs themselves and look for, for failures in the okay. status. That's a good pattern for now. Cool. Thank you. Sure. So uh, great presentation. Um, in the multi-cluster SIG, we're looking at uh, disaster recovery use cases and trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, I was just curious whether you'd seen anybody do this particular scenario where you have like a primary cluster and a secondary cluster and something that monitors if the primary cluster goes down and then uses, you know, ARC to basically, you know, launch what was running on the primary on the secondary. That's a very good question. Um, I don't think we've heard any specific requests around that, but one of the things that is on our roadmap is being able to take a backup that was in, say, one region, if you're on a cloud, and be able to migrate that over to a different region and restore over there. So that, that potentially could play into what you're looking to do. Um, but I think ARC could definitely fit into that picture in terms of monitoring and automating uh, moving uh, the, the data from cluster to cluster as needed. And I would, I would also add to that that um, because because ARC uses CRDs, you always have the option to write a layer yourself on top of ARC that's monitoring the health of your primary cluster. And if there is a disaster, you can write code to basically create a restore CRD in your secondary cluster and automatically restore uh, objects into that. So that's, that's something you can very easily do around ARC. Cool, thanks. It's a very helpful building block. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, OK, I'm wondering, like, what are uh, preconditions that might cause ARC to fail? Like, I, the guy asked a question before, gave me an idea. Um, what if, let's say, you 
tore down a namespace or you lost a namespace that you had backed up and you wanted to restore it, but for some reason somebody brought that namespace up and maybe had some of the resources created already, what would happen if I did a restore? Sure, so what Arc does right now is it will try to create every single object that you've specified as part of the restore, and if it encounters any conflicts, it logs it as a warning, right? Or it puts it in the status as a warning right now. So it's very visible when you see that the restore has completed. It'll tell you if there were any errors, which would be catastrophic. It'll tell you if there are any warnings, such as there was a conflict. At the present, we just record that fact. So if there's something that's already pre-existing in the namespace, we won't touch it. In the future, what we'd like to do is make it pluggable so that you can say, on a conflict, here is custom logic to run to make the decision do I patch what's in there already with what I have? Do I accept what's already there? Or do I replace what's there with what came from the backup? Are there any types of resources that don't behave so well than when they're restored from a backup as if, you know, compared to just being created? Yes. Uh, the one that I can think of off the top of my head is load balancer services. Those depend on the UID of the service, and that's not a field that is something you can mutate or set. It's set by the API server itself. So if you have a load balancer API service tied to, say, an Amazon ELB, if you take a backup and you do a restore, you're going to get a different one, unfortunately. Okay. And hopefully, we can work with the community to see if we can solve that. And how are you typing so fast? Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I've got to thank Joe Bita for finding a script on GitHub. Um, I think it's called Demo Magic, where um, all of that was a real demo. I just was hitting enter to get it to type for me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks. Thank you. Go ahead in the middle. Uh, I'd like to know the performance of the back uh, backup. And uh, do we backup bad data or the full backup every time? So we'll go as fast as the API server will let us. Um, right now, we aren't setting the QPS on the client, so I believe the default is about five requests a second, which certainly could be slow if you have a lot of data. Uh, we do plan to make that configurable. And then as far as the PV snapshots go, it's as fast as your cloud provider or whatever you're using can do the snapshots. Over here. Great. So just to um, tie into the last two comments, it would be great to see it run faster, actually, because it takes a couple hours to do a restore. So in the event of a major outage, it'll be pretty difficult for us. And you know, our etcd size is about 850 megs, um, two to 3,000 pods, and a whole ton of config maps that uh, Helm leaves behind. Um, uh, and the other thing is, so what are we doing about the load balancers? Because that's a major impediment to a restore. Um, I have been involved in a little bit of discussion about that with the community. I honestly don't know where it currently stands, but we will be following up with that. Okay. Thanks. Hi, so my question's related to previous ones also. Um, how well does it interface with other things that are managing resources? Like if I do a Helm deploy, it's kind of keeping track of what resources are part of the chart and something horrible happens, everything goes away, I restore using Arc. If I do another Helm deploy, will it pick up correctly or will it will try to start a whole new thing? Um, I'm not intimately familiar with Helm, but um, the way that our backups and restores generally work is we back up the majority of the object. We may strip off status, for example, and then um, most of our objects we restore as is. There's a couple of exceptions here and there. So um, if there are certain pieces of data that you need that we're accidentally stripping off or you know, not on purpose, then uh, please file an issue if you find uh, problems and we'll correct them. Okay, great, thanks. I think we have time for one more over yep. here. So to answer the question earlier for load balancers, uh, there's actually an open PR to set the load balancer name, which cloud providers use to look up load balancers. So then they would be able to, they'd be able to restore then and not rely on the UID for a name. That's open, so if you want to go comment on that PR, we're trying to figure out a good way. Um, but also for a question for Arc, what about resources managed outside of Kubernetes, like DNS, to have a hook for if you need to have a new load balancer like right now? to have DNS be able to update as well, um, to have like an outside hook 
Uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I would be happy to talk more about exactly where the hook would fit in. Uh, and feel free to file a GitHub issue and, and we can talk about it. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. I think we're about out of time. Thanks, everyone.